there guys and gals, I'm Mercury the Personality, and we're sitting here in Fulton Park, otherwise known as Harriet Tubman Park, and also, you know, Robert Fulton, okay, yes, so you know I'm always happy and bubbly, so I'm sitting here with Robert Carnegie Jr., and we're sitting on the Fulton Art Fair, Inc., it's just been unveiled today, today's June 16th, and we are doing an art festival here, and uh, Robert, Mr. Carney Jr. Uh, just unveiled this bench, so whenever anybody sits on this bench, they should feel honored, okay, and privileged. So can you please tell me a little bit about how much this means to you and the community? So this, this is a tremendous day. So the Fulton Art Fair is a, a fair that has been centered around uh, black art for 60 years. It's actually the 60th anniversary. Um, and today we get to honor its founders, well, three of its founders, um, by this bench, uh, dedicated uh, by my office and the uh, Parks and Recreation Department. Um, and it was just a beautiful thing to see all of these artists who annually look for this opportunity to display their art to the community. Um, people forget uh, the gentrification and the change of demographics in the community, how important uh, black culture was, and how important the arts have been to, to black culture. And I say the arts because uh, this is just one medium of art that we've experienced and that we've had a chance to enjoy uh, through painters. And some of the greatest painters uh, in Otto Neal was, was here today. Uh, and I'm excited he's in his 90s. Um, both him and Emmett uh, began the Fulton Art in the Fulton Art they're in their 20s. And they're both either in their 80s or 90s at this point. So their commitment. It's, it's astounding, right? To have anything going that long, 60 years, is amazing. Um, so, uh, while the community again is changing, and we talk about that ugly word, which is gentrification, um, now we have an opportunity to, no matter who's here, see this bench, Google those names, understand what they've meant not only to our community and to black culture, but to the world, because their art is worldly now. So it was found. It was established in 1958. That's when the um, art, um, the art, um, excuse me, the Fulton Art Fair. I'm getting a little nervous because I'm sitting with greatness. And when I sit with greatness, sometimes you know I get a little tongue-tied. So pardon me, okay? But anyway, um, it's established in 1958, um, founded by Shirley Hawkins. So you guys can definitely Google that name and get a plethora of information. And then we have Jacob Lawrence, and we also have Ernest. Critchlow, Critchlow, C R C R I C H L O W. Okay, so you guys check that out, and also, um, what, what does this mean? This um, this day mean for you as far as you know, um, moving forward for our history? Do do you see it um, bringing us together? Since you know, since there are more you know people here in the community that have not been here. Um, do you think that that will bring us together, this this um, this um new thing? Yeah, I think, I think um, it, it allows us to share um, our talents uh, with our community, uh, as the community changes, but also with the world. Um, today, today is a really, really special day for me because a lot of times we don't have an opportunity, we don't have either the political figures who are willing uh, to push back and to make sure, and in me, we have that. So I really appreciate the fact that we have the this community to now be able to leave a legacy for those uh, who've meant so much to the community. And people would say, well, it's only a bench. Listen, we, we start our monuments in what means a lot to us. Uh, there are people who line these benches on a daily basis, whether it's uh, out here with their children, whether it's just enjoying the beauty of Fulton Park. Um, there are many festivals that take place in this park, Gospel Fest. So there are many people who frequent uh, this park. Uh, some of them are black, some of them are white. The community is changing, the demographics are changing. But now they get to understand that we've made major contributions, not only to this area. And going forward, I've committed, my office has committed $250,000 per year for the next four years to erect statues within our community that speak directly to uh, the black experience and the black contribution to culture in this country and in this city. So in next fall, we'll be unveiling uh, God willing, we'll be unveiling the first in a series of statues and monuments. Uh, this one will be of Shirley Chisholm, who is our Congress, who was our Congresswoman from this area, um, the first woman to run, black woman to run for president, um, and the first uh, black woman to be a Congressperson, um, was from this area. 
uh, not far from here actually, and we'll be unveiling a statue of her likeness uh, so that people will know, no matter what the demographics are of the community, uh, who was here before them and what they meant to the, the entire world. Right. I, uh, you know, um, I just wanted to say um, quickly that uh, I really feel that education and knowledge is the, a lot of the times the reason why we, you know, um, we're a little bit behind, you know, um, you know, our advancement as far as, you know, for ourselves and having other communities and other um, races respect us because we're not educating each other like we're not coming back. You know, a lot of times we get successful and then we don't come back. And I feel that that's a lot of the reasons why we're getting edged out of our communities because our own people end up becoming successful and great and then they forget or they want to just be like, oh, you can do it too, but they don't come back. How do you feel about the coming back? Well, so it's funny because there was a time period in this community where it wasn't as desirable to be here and we were more relegated to be here. This is the only place that black people could be. And through integration, we were able to move in different parts of the city. But there was a time when you lived on, if you lived on Putnam, you could live next door to somebody who's uh, in abstract poverty on one side and somebody who's an attorney on the other side because we were relegated to be here. And because of that, a lot of people thought bad about the community because they said, if I have to be here and I'm forced to be here, it must not be that great. No, but, but it is. But it is. But the first opportunity, you know, I... I, I, I but we segregated ourselves. We do that. That's what I'm saying about the bringing us back, like bringing, bringing, coming back together and not separating. Like you just said, that's the main crux of what I'm saying, right. that it would be a crackhead right next door to a person that's a, a lawyer. How come he's not helping out this crackhead? That's right. my point. Well, it, it depends on what family came from because I came from a family that... If that person who was on drugs was your elder, you had to treat him with the same respect that you treated the, the attorney. So how do we get that to happen? How do we get to see, to let people know that, yes, you can't escape. Yeah, you can make it, but you can't escape. We need you. Right. So I think a lot of people are uh, wanting to come. bed is so desirable now. People want to come back and can't come back. So there are people who have moved away who find themselves either in the suburbs, either they're in Westchester or Long Island, because they thought that that was the place to be once you're successful, and now realize that the Mecca still ex still resides here, but are having difficulty coming back. So that's one of the struggles and the fights that I have to make sure that the, there's housing available to my people who want to come back to a community that some may say that they forsake at some point, but you know how it is in our community. You're welcome to come home at any time. Right, and you wasn't supposed to leave. You were supposed to help. You were supposed, so to, stay. You were supposed to stay and help, and quite frankly, some people did, but more people left that. because they thought that they were, they were conditioned to believe that where they were was undesirable. Exactly, so my question is, how do we get people to understand that this is the reason why we are losing our place because we thought about this undesirableness and how do we get people to understand of that we are desirable like so the funny thing is the one thing that always was a common thread no matter where you move to was our art and our culture because if you were in so you upstate new york i think that's the connection i think it's always been the connection you could go to westchester where someone uh black was affluent and they were playing jazz at their house right. Or you could go to Long Island where somebody had the opportunity to move all the way to Riverhead or whatever, and you would go to their home and they'd be playing jazz. Absolutely. So our connection has always been through our culture and our music and our art. Okay. And having a respect and a healthy respect for your art and your culture will again unite our community, um, uh, if not physically, mentally. Because as you may know, that the first thing that happens when you leave, like before you even leave, you've left mentally. That's right. And before you physically leave. That's right. So what we've got to do is that same thing in reverse. We've got to bring people home uh, mentally first. And I think that our music and our art and showing an example of how we can preserve it Will, will be an open invitation for people to come home, if not physically and literally, spiritually and mentally. I like that. I like that. Um, so, yeah, you know, I was so, um, I get really excited when I see people and I want to, you know, talk to them. And I like to talk to them before the crowd gets there, you know. And so I had to clear my mind and I walked up and down, um, you know, just so I can get back into, you know, my, my one so that I could talk to you again. And I saw some really, really great art. Did you get a chance to see any of the art? Um, I, I did. So um, some of this, like we, we have space in my office where we've turned into a gallery. So people are able to show their art because so many people who are hurting come to my office for help and they need to see themselves reflected in the art. Right. We've actually partnered with uh, Interfaith Hospital okay. to change their walls from the Starks uh, dank kind of art that they get collectively right. 
to, to actually, generic art, the generic art to actually our artists are displaying their art in the hospitals and that. in those institutions. Be, and, and so one of the funny thing is the first time that my ambassador to arts and culture presented the idea to the administration there, they, they picked up on it. They took down all their art, they painted the walls and they asked artists uh, like Danny Simmons yes, and, yes, and some I'm other people Danny. to yes. come in and display their arts. The, the, the unintended consequence that we found was that I had staff come and say that they felt better about coming to work because the art reflected who they were. That's right. So we know the healing properties of art. And when we did it, we thought that it would be a healing, it would have a healing property for people who were sick at the hospital. Right, but it's also it, the employees. It did that, but it also changed the, the idea of people visiting their families and the employees. Right. So we know the effect that art has when it's representative of you and your spirit and your community, we just need to do more of that. So we're doing it in um, in hospital in, and institutions. We did it there and we took it to Woodhall and then we did it in Brookdale. So right now Woodhall, for a fact, Woodhall Hospital, Interfaith Hospital and Brookdale display art of local artists okay. who've contributed their art and it rotates out. Excellent. So, so we want to do that in more municipal buildings. I would love we're, that. We're, we're present. We should be present. That's right. So That's right. Frequenting those buildings, whether it's through um, visiting patients or sick ourselves or employed in those buildings, why shouldn't the art be reflective of our collective experience in this country? That's right. And so when we decided to do that, the the morale actually changed in the hospital, which is passed down to the patients. Right. So it was very secular. Right. So adding art, <laughs> I assert that adding art in any circumstance immediately increases their circumstance. Absolutely, I agree. I definitely agree. And just, you know, um, to wrap it all up, um, if you can remind the people of yourself and, you know, some of the great accomplishments that you have done for the community and also for yourself personally. So my name is Robert Cornegie Jr. I am the council member for the 36th Council District. I represent the wonderful, vibrant villages of Bedford-Stuyvesant and Northern Crown Heights. And, you know, I wake up every morning excited to do on behalf of my constituents everything from affordable housing, to job creation, to wealth building, to pathways to home ownership. Um, so every day I'm excited about the opportunities that it presents to represent this community. It's been my greatest opportunity was to represent the constituents of Bedford-Stuyvesant and Northern Crown Heights. They've given me a tremendous opportunity. This is my second term. I have three and a half years left and I intend to use every second of that three and a half years on behalf of building back uh, black culture within our community. That's right, get us the Black Wall Street. Get our Black Wall Street back up. Um, and also, um, if you can give our, um, give your, um, your um, uh, location, that's what I meant, oh sorry. If you can give your location so that we can, you know, if anyone wants to stop in, if anyone wants to email you, you know, your contacts, you know, so that, you know, people can get more involved. So uh, currently we share, uh, we're on the beautiful campus of Restoration Plaza. Okay. Uh, which is 1360 Fulton Street, Suite 500. Um, for those of you who don't follow addresses and numbers, I'm right above Applebee's on Fulton Street on the fifth floor. Applebee's! Yeah. Uh, I don't know, Applebee's is not paying us for this, so we, you may want to edit out the shout out to Applebee's. <laughs> no, but seriously, we're in, we're in the Applebee's building on the wonderful campus of Restoration, uh, which is a nonprofit that's been in existence. It's the first community development corporation in the country um, and has served this community admirably. And we look to work there and to grow that campus to make sure that it's accessible to all the constituents and they get their needs met there. So I'm centrally located intentionally so that I can, I can, you can get to me in what we refer to as downtown Bed-Stuy on any day of the week. Okay, excellent. It was a pleasure meeting you. I was nice very excited. Hold on, I'm got sweaty palms. Wait, wait, wait. It's a pleasure, wait, <laughs> it's nice a pleasure to meet you. you. Yes, thank you. Is it possible we could take a picture? It'll be my pleasure. Yes. We'll be back.